The mysteries of Malkin Tower. It was a subterranean chamber, gloomy and of vast extent, the roof low and supported by nine ponderous stone columns, to which rings and rusty chains were attached, still retaining the mouldering bones of those they had held captive in life. Amongst others was a gigantic skeleton, quite entire, with an iron girdle around the middle. Fragments of mortality were elsewhere scattered about, showing the numbers who had perished in the place. On either side were cells closed by massive doors secured by bolt and lock. At one end were three immense coffers made of oak, good with iron, fastened by large padlocks. Near them stood a large armory, likewise of oak, and sculptured with the ensigns of Wally Abbey, proving it at once belonged to that establishment. Probably it had been carried off by some robber band. At the opposite end of the vault were two niches, each occupied by a rogue hoon statue, the one representing a warlike figure with a visage of extraordinary ferocity, and the other an anchoress in a hood and wimble with a rosary in her hand. On the ground beneath lay a plain flag covering the mortal remains of the wee pair and proclaiming them to be Isolde Hetton and Black the Freebooter. Pillars were ranged in three lines so as to form with arches above them a series of short passages in the midst of which stood an altar and near it a large cauldron. In front elevated on a block of granite was a marvellous piece of sculpture wrought in jet and representing a demon seated on a throne. The visage was human but the that of a goat while the feet and the lower limbs were like those of the same animal. Two curled horns grew and the ears, and a bird shaped like conch sprang from the centre of the forehead from which burst a blue flame, throwing a ghastly light on the objects surrounding it. The only discernible approach to the vault was a steep and narrow stone staircase, closed at the top by a heavy trap door. Other outlets apparently there was not some little air was admitted to this file of board through flues contrived in the wall, the entrances to which were gated, but the light of day never came there. The flame, however, issuing from the brow of the demon image like the lamps in the sepulchres of the disciples of the Rose Day Cross was ever burning. Behind the stable statue was deep well with water as black as ink, wherein swarmed snakes and toads and other noxious reptiles. And as the lurid light fell upon its surface, it glittered like a dusky mirror, and less was broken by the horrible things that lurked beneath or crawled about upon its slimy brim. But snakes and toads were not the only tenants of the vault. At the head of the steps squatted a monstrous and misshapen animal, bearing some resemblance to a cat, but as big as a tiger. Its skin was black and shaggy, its eyes glowed like those of that hyena, and its cry was like that of the same treacherous. Beast. Among the gloomy colonnades, other swart and bestial shapes would be indistinctively seen moving to and fro. In this abode of horror were two human beings, one a young maiden of exquisite beauty, and the other almost a child and strangely deformed. The elder, overpowered by terror, was clinging to a pillar for support, while the younger, who might naturally be expected to exhibit the greatest alarm, appeared wholly unconcerned and derided her companion's fears. Oh, Janet, exclaimed the elder of the two, is there no means of escape? None whatever replied the other. You must stay here till Granny Demdee comes for you, or that the earth would open and snatch me from these horrors, cried Alison. My reason is forsaking me. Would I could kneel and pray for deliverance, but something prevents me. Read, replied Janet. It's as much as your life's worth to kneel and pray here, unless you choose to get and throw yourself at the feet of yon black image. Kneel to the idol, never, exclaimed Alison, and while striving to call upon heaven for aid, a sharp convulsion seized her and deprived her of the power of utterance. I told you how it was he, remarked Janet, who watched her narrowly. You know I a church here, and if you want to worship, it mun be at yon altar. Do you know you're here how angry the cats are, how they growl and spit, and see how their iron glisten. They'll tear you in pieces, like so many tigers, if you offend them. Tell me why I am brought here, Janet, inquired Alison, after a brief pause. Granny Demdy will tell you that, replied the little girl. But to my belief, she added with a mocking laugh, who means to me a wish or ye like all the rest on us? She cannot do that without my consent, cried Alison, and I would die a thousand deaths rather than yield it. That remains to be seen, replied Janet, haughtingly. You're obstinate enough, no doubt, for granny them deep, did you deal with sick or Oh, why was I born, cried Alison bitterly. You may well ask that, responded Janet, with a loud and feeling laugh, for I see no great use. You're on with your pretty face and bright eyes, unless it be to make one hate ye. Is it possible you can say this to me, Janet, cried Alison? What have I done to incur your hatred? I have ever loved you and striven to please and serve you. I have always taken your part against others, even when you were in the wrong. Oh, Janet, you cannot hate me. But I do, replied the girl silently. I hate ye now worse than anyone else. I hate ye because you are no longer my sister, because you're a grand lady daughter and a grand lady yourself. I hate you because young Rochelle Ashton loves you, and because you have better luck, I or think than I have or can expect to have. That's why I hate you, Alison. When you are a witch, I shall love you, more. then we shall be equals one more. That will never be, Janet, said Alison, sadly firm. Your grandmother may immure me in this dungeon.
religion and scare away my senses so she will never rob me of my horse and salvation as the words were uttered a clang like that you fire stream gong shut the vault and east roared fiercely the black waters of the fountain bubbled up and were lashed into form by the angry reptile and a larger jet of flame than before burst from the brow of the demon statue I have warned you Alison said Janet alarmed by these demonstrations but since you pay no heed to all I say I'd leave you to your fate or oh, stay with me stay with me Janet shrieked Alison by our past sisterly affection I implore you to remain you are some protection to me from these dreadful beings I do not want to protect you unless you do as you are bidden replied Janet why should you be better than me ah why indeed cried Alison would I have the power to turn your heart to open your eyes to evil to save you Janet these words were followed by another clang louder and more brattling than first the solid walls of the dungeon were shaken and the heavy columns rocked while to Alison the frightened gaze it seemed as if the sable statue arose on its even throne and stretched out its arm menacingly towards her the poor girl was saved from further terror by insensibility how long she remained in this condition she could not tell nor did it appear that any efforts were made to restore her but when she recovered she found herself stretched upon a rude pallet within an arched recess the entrance of which was screened by a piece of tapestry on lifting it aside she see she was no longer in the vault but in an upper chamber as she judged and not incorrectly of the tower the room was lofty and circular and the walls of enormous thickness as shown by the deep embrasures of the windows in one of which the outlet having been built up the pallet was placed a massive oak table two or three chairs of antique shape and a wooden stool constituted the furniture of the room the stool was set near the fireplace and beside it stood a strangely fashioned spinning wheel which had apparently been recently used but neither the old hag nor her granddaughter were visible Alison could not tell whether it was night or day but a lamp was burning upon the table its feeble light only imperfectly illuminating the chamber and scarcely revealing several strange objects dangling from the huge beam that sought the roof faded arms were hung against the walls representing in one compartment the last language of Isol the Hedden and her lover Blackman. in another the Saxon Urtred hanging from the summit of Malkin Tower and in a further executioner of Abbot Haslow the subjects were as large as life admirably depicted and evidently were at wondrous saloon as they swayed to and fro in the gust that found entrance into the chamber through some unprotected loopholes the figures had a grim and just the air and trembling they would have Alison set forth and stacked him towards the table and sank on a chair beside it a fearful storm raging about one of the light of the weekend rain stung and blinded with her eyes and made those to the fury of the sights and the weekend rays and she was roused and led by a sound of the fog and found it receded from the trap door rising slowly from Catford appeared on the level of war, then a broad lotion face and mouth and chin fringed with a wide ears like a whisk of a cat and fit on the floor, then a pair of long shoulders, then a square hideous frame, and with an empty slutty form, malignant smile played upon the hideous countenance and looked from her eyes. Those eyes so strange and placed by nature, as if to intimate her doom, and that of her fate raised to whom the horrible blemish was transmitted, as the old witch moved heavily upon the ground, the trap door was behind her. So you are better, Alison, you are quitting your couch, I find. Striking her staff upon the floor, but you look faint and feeble still. I will give you something to revive you. I have wondrous cordial in your closet, a rare restorative. Ha ha, it will make you well the moment it has had your lips. I will bet you at once. I will have none of it, replied Alison. I would rather die, rather die, echoed Mother Denby sarcastically. Because forsooth you are crossing love, you shall have the man of your heart. Yet if you will only follow my counsel and do as I bid you, Richard Ashton shall be yours and with your mother's consent. Provided. I understand the condition you annex to the promise into the hours and the terms upon which you would fulfill it. You seek in vain to tempt me, old woman, and now comprehend why I am brought here. I indeed exclaimed the old wish. Why is it then since you are so committed? You desire to make an offering to the evil being you serve, cried Alison, who still met you. You have entered into some dark compass which compels you to deliver over the Fine, or your own soul becomes for it. Thus you have hitherto lengthened out your wretched life, and you ought to extend the term yet further through me. I have heard this tale before, but I would not believe it. Now I do. This is why you have stolen me from my mother, have braved her anger, and brought me to this impious tower, the old hag laughed hoarsely. The tale thou hast heard respecting me is true, she said. I have a compact which requires me to make a proselyte to the power I serve within each year, and if I fail in doing so, I must pay the penalty thou hast mentioned. 
a light compact exists between Mistress Nutter and the fine. She paused for a moment to watch the effect of her words on Alison and then resumed. Thy mother would have sacrificed thee if thou hadst been left with her, but I have carried thee off because I conceive I am best entitled to thee. Thou wert brought up as my granddaughter, and therefore I claim thee as my own. And you think to deal with me as if I were a puppet in your hands, cried Alison. I am married, do I? rejoined Mother MD with a scream of laughter. Thou art nothing more than a puppet, a puppet all, all. and you deem you can dispose of my soul without my consent, said Alison. Thy full consent will be obtained, rejoined the high. Think it not, think it not, exclaimed Alison, or I shall yet be delivered from this infernal bondage. At this moment, the notes of a bugle were heard. Save, save, cried poor girl, starting. It is Richard, come to my rescue. How knowest thou that, cried Mother MD with a spiteful look. By an instinct that never deceives, replied Alison, as the blast was again heard. This must be stopped, said the high, waving her staff over the maid and transfixing her where she sat, after which she took up the lamp and strolled towards the window. The few words that passed between her and Richard have been already recounted. Having closed the casement and drawn the curtain before it, Mother MD traced a circle on the floor, muttered a spell, and then waving her staff over Alison, restored her power of speech and motion. "'Twas he," exclaimed the young girl, as soon as she could find utterance. "'I heard his voice. Why, I, twas he, sure enough, rejoined the bald dame. He has come on a fool errand, but he shall never return from it. Does Mistress Nutter think I will give up my prize the moment I have obtained it for the mere asking? Does she imagine she can frighten me as she frightens others? Does she know whom she has to deal with? If not, I will tell her. I am the oldest, the boldest, and the strongest of the witches. No mystery, the black art is known to me. I can do what mischief I will, and my desolating hand has been felt throughout this history. You may trace it like pestilence. No one has offended me, but I have terribly repaid him. I rule over the land like me. I exact tributes, and if they are not rendered, I smite with a sharper edge than the sword. My worship is paid to the Prince of Darkness. This tower is his temple, and yon subterranean chamber, the place where the mystical rites, which thou wouldest call impious and damnable, are performed. Countless Sabbaths have I attended within it, or upon Rumble's Moor, or on the summit of Pendle Hill, or within the ruins of Wally Abbey. Many proselytes have I made, many unbaptized babes offered in sacrifice. I am high priestess to the demon, and thy mother would unsert mine office. Oh, spare me this horrible recital, exclaimed Alison, vainly trying to shut out the hag's piercing voice. I will spare thee nothing, pursued Mother MD. Thy mother, I say, will be high priestess in my seed. There are degrees among witches as among other sects, and mine is first. Mistress Nutter would deprive me of my office, but not tell her hair as is white as mine, her knowledge equal to mine, and her hatred of mankind as intense as mine. Not till then shall she have it. No more of this in pity, cried Alison. Often have I aided thy mother in her dark sleep, assured her implacable hag. Nay, no latter than last night I obliterated all boundaries of her land and erected new marks to serve her. It was a strong exercise of power, but the command came to me and I obeyed it. No other witch could have achieved so much, not even the accursed Chattox, and she is next to myself. And how does thy mother purpose to requite me? By thrusting me aside and stepping into my throne. You must be in error, cried Alison, scarcely knowing what to say. My information never fails me, replied the hag, with a disdainful laugh. Her plans are made known to me as soon as formed. I have those about her and keep strict watch upon her actions and report them faithfully. I know why she brought thee so suddenly to Rugley, though thou knowest it not. She brought me there for safety, remarked the young girl, hoping to ally the Bell Dame's fury, and because she herself desired to know how the survey of boundaries would end. She brought thee there to sacrifice thee to the fine pride that had infernal rage and malice blaring in her eyes. She failed in propitiating him at meeting in the ruined church of Wally last night. When thou thyself were present and delivered Dorothy Asherton from the snare in which she was taken, and since then all has gone wrong with her, having demanded from her familiar the cause why all things ran counter, she was told she had failed in the fulfilment of her promise that a proselyte was required, and that thou alone wouldst be accepted. I exclaimed Alison, horror I thou, cried I, no choice was allowed her, and the offering must be made tonight. After a long and painful struggle, thy mother consented. Oh no, impossible, you deceive me, cried the wretched girl. I tell thee she consented, rejoined Mother MD coldly, and on this she made instant arrangements to return home, and in sight, as thou knowest, of Sir Ralph and Lady Ashton's efforts to detain her, set forth with thee. All this I know, observed Alison sadly, and intelligence of our departure from the Abbey was conveyed to you, I conclude, by Janet, to whom I bade adore. Thou art right, it was, returned the hag, but I have yet more to tell thee, for I will lay the secrets of thy mother's dark breast fully before thee. Her time is well nigh run, thou wert made 
pay the price of its extension. If she fails in offering thee all tonight, and thou art here in my keeping, the find a master will abandon her, and she will be delivered to the justice of men. Alison covered her face with horror. After a while, she looked up and exclaimed with unutterable anguish, I cannot help her, and unpitying the hag laughed derisively. She cannot be utterly lost, continued the young girl. Were I near her, I would show her that heaven is merciful to the greatest sinner who repents, and teach her how to gain the lost path to salvation. Peace, under the witch, shaking her huge hand at her, and stamping her heavy foot on the ground. Such words must not be uttered here. They are an offence to me. Thy mother has renounced all hopes of heaven. She has been baptised in the baptism of hell, branded on the brow by the red finger of his ruler, and cannot be wrestled from her. It is too late. No, no, it can never be too late, cried Alison. It is not even too late for you. Thou knowest not what thou talkest about, foolish wench. Join the hag. Our master will tear us instantly in pieces if but a thought of penitence, as thou calls it, cross our mind. We are both doomed to an eternity of torture, but thy mother will go her I first. If she had yielded thee up tonight, another term would have been allowed her. But as I owe thee instead, the benefit of the sacrifice would be mine. But heist, what was that to you forget? Alice Nutter must have given him some potent counter charm. He comes to deliver me, cried Alison. Richard, and she arose and would have flown to the window. But Mother Demdy waved her staff over her and rooted her to the ground. Stay there till I require thee, shall the hag move and ponderous or steps to the door. After parleying with Richard, as already related, Mother Demdy suddenly returned to Alison and restoring her to sensibility, placed her hideous face close to her, breathing upon her and uttering these words, Be thy eyes blinded and thy brain confused, so that thou mayest not know him when thou seest him, but think him another. The spell took instant effect. Alison staggered towards the table. Richard was summoned, and on his appearance, the scene took place which has already been detailed, and which ended in his losing the tail and being ejected from the tower. Alison had been rendered invisible by the old witch and was afterwards dragged into the arch recesses by her, where, snatching the piece of gold from the young girl's neck, she exclaimed triumphantly, Now I defy thee, Alice Nutter, thou canst never recover thy child. The offering shall be made tonight, and another year be added to my long term. Alison groaned deeply, but at a gesture from the hag she became motionless and speechless. A dusky, indistinctly seen figure hovered near the entrance of the embrasure. Mother Demdy beckoned it to her, conveyed this girl to the vault and watch over her, she said, I will descend anon. Upon this, the shadowy arms enveloped Alison, the trap door flew open, and the figure disappeared with its inanimate curtain.